We have two more sessions for you. First up, land conservation. Land, legacy, and special places. Switching from water to land. Uh, for this session, we'll be treated by a viewpoint talk. We will have a panel discussion and a round of lightning talks. For our viewpoint talk, we have actually paired up a threesome. John O'Miller, Julie Morris, and Cooper Levy Baker. Let me give you some brief introductions, although perhaps no introductions are needed. John O'Miller first put a canoe in the Mayaka River at Snook Haven 47 years ago. Since then, he has consulted, guided, and taught about the river. He is currently the chair of the Mayaka River Management Coordinating Council, on which he has served for 31 years. And that 1971 canoe trip, it ended on Sanibel Island. Julie Morris. Julie Morris began exploring the Mayaka Valley as a new college student in 1974 when she paddled from Snook Haven to Sanibel. I think they must have been on the same trip. <laughs> <laughs> she wrote her senior thesis about management of exotic aquatics in Upper Mayaka Lake. She campaigned to purchase the Carlton Reserve. She drafted portions of the Mayaka Prairie's acquisition nomination and is a board member of the Mayaka Conservancy. Julie and Jono own a cabin on the river near Old Mayaka, and they paddle and hike in the watershed every year. Jur Julie is currently the Associate Vi Vice President for Academic Affairs at New College. Cooper Levy Baker, the young one. <laughs> This is an uh, intergenerational pair, pairing. Cooper Levy Baker is currently an associate editor with Sarasota Magazine. He has written about food, politics, civic issues, the arts, and music in Southwest Florida for more than a decade. I would add that he writes about environmental issues as well, focusing on climate change, the natural environment, uh, and we wish his Cheap Eats column would come back. <laughs> All right, I'm going to introduce uh, Jono first, no, no Cooper sorry. first, uh, and they are going to share the mic. Thank you all so much. Um, so before we get started, can I just get a show of hands? How many of y'all have uh, visited Mayaka River State Park before? Okay, how many people have camped out there? Good number. How, how many of you have kayaked or canoed along the river out there? Awesome. I figured this would be a good crowd for this. So it's wonderful. So we would probably know everything I'm about to say. Um, so just, uh, you know, uh, can we do the next slide, please? Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the Mayaka River, love it or lose it. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so as Jennifer mentioned, I'm a reporter with Sirison Magazine, and hands down, one of the most fun assignments that I've had in recent years was when I worked with some of our other editors to put together a special feature about Mayaka River State Park for our December issue last year. Um, you know, like most people, I grumble a lot about my job, but then I'm out there kayaking on the Mayaka River on a Monday morning, and, um, you know, I realize I don't have it too bad at all. Um, and the experience of researching and writing that story, like, really taught me so much about the park. Um, you know, I'd visited it dozens of times before. Um, and thought I really knew a lot about it, but I was completely wrong. Um, so I'm just going to share a little bit with you about what I've learned about the park. Uh, but more than that, I really just want to emphasize um, how having an emotional connection to the natural world around us can mean a lot as we're making decisions about public policy and the world we're leaving behind for future generations. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so these are our photos from about 10 years ago. This is um, primitive camping at Bee Island, uh, which is an area in the eastern part of the park. Uh, that's me and my wife, Rachel. Um, and every New Year's Eve for a few years, uh, my friends and I and, and my wife would go out there camping. Um, John pointed this out, but the wheelbarrow in the upper left one, that's me making breakfast right there, but the wheelbarrow uh, is important because uh, it being New Year's, we used to pack the wheelbarrow with uh, bottles of champagne and dry ice and kind of push the wheelbarrow out along the trail to uh, celebrate the New Year's when we would go camping out there. Um, and, you know, before this time, I had been out to the park a bunch of times. I had done the canopy walkway, done the sort of boat tour on, along the lake and stuff. But I really had no sense of kind of this eastern part of the park, which was all new to me and, and very exciting. Um, so, again, that's me cooking breakfast. There's espresso and, and bacon going, uh, the headlamp selfie. And the other thing, you know, I love about camping is you can just roll around in the dirt and you don't care. It's fine. <laughs> 
And breakfast is also really good too. Um, and I credit Rachel with, really with getting me back into camping. I grew up in Oregon. And when I was a kid, we'd go camping every third weekend. But after we moved away from there, we kind of stopped. Um, and I'd gone a decade without camping before. And Rachel, who was born in Brooklyn, had never been camping before in her life. But she really pushed me to go camping again and really reconnected me to this part of my soul that kind of I'd forgotten about or lost. So to move on, uh, next slide, please. You know, you can't talk about the park without talking about Bertha Palmer. Um, she was born in 1849 in Louisville, Kentucky, um, and moved to Chicago at a young age. Um, she married a wealthy developer there named Potter Palmer, and after, her, after his death, um, starting in around 1910, she started buying up a ton of land in this area, um, including much of kind of what is today Mayaka State Park. But at the time, she was using it for uh, a cattle operation. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is just a historical photo showing uh, cattle out on one of the Mayaka prairies. And she wasn't the only rancher in the area, of course, um, but she was considered innovative in her technique. She fenced in her property, which kind of outraged some of the locals, and she developed a process of dipping cattle in this arsenic solution to um, control pests. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so after uh, Bertha died in 1918, her sons worked with uh, Sarasota's first mayor, A.B. Edwards, and uh, together they all helped combine tens of thousands of acres of property that was preserved and then eventually became Mayaka River State Park, uh, which is one of the state's oldest and biggest parks. Uh, I bring this up because it's an example of how um, this area has always, you know, you've always seen this push and pull between human use um, and the natural environment. You know, there is not this one pristine moment that we can go back to where sort of everything was unspoiled, but this area has always seen kind of, um, you know, a combination of human use and, and, and natural splendor. Um, and I think it's also illustrative of the power that indiv individuals can have working with local governments, state governments, and the federal government um, to be forward thinking and to think about future generations and setting aside land. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is the interior of one of the, the cabins that's out there at the park. The cabins were built in the 1930s as part of New Deal legislation. Um, Civilian Conservation Corps workers actually came to the park and built these cabins that are still there. Um, they've recently been renovated. This is, um, you know, they're swanky by cabin standards, I'd say, um, but they're very nice to stay in. And air conditioned, so, you know, it's, which is big kind of in the summer times. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just the exterior one of the cabins. Um, you know, cabin three, just a little tip, is a great one if you want to be like kind of secluded and off on your own. If you've got a big party, four and five are good if you want to combine. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is um, a really special experience I had right in this story. Uh, they call it the flooded forest. So it was a Monday morning. I was set out to go kayaking, and it had rained all weekend. And I thought, oh, the park's flooded. Like, we're not going to be able to go out. But the guide I was going with said, nope, we're going. You know, like, we're still going out there. And actually, this was a really special opportunity because the water kind of was over, I mean, dry land. So normally, this would just be dry land. Um, but you could actually put your kayak in and just kind of float out through the trees. Um, and it was an incredible experience. Uh, it was you know, a really powerful reminder of the way that, you know, the, the park doesn't just change, you know, from season to season, but really day by day and even hour by hour. You know, when it started off, it was, it, you know, it rained a lot, but it was still nice out. Um, but by the end, we were completely drenched. Um, next slide, please. So this is, us, you know, uh, yeah, we survived. Uh, we made it. Um, you know, there was, I was really scared of gators at first. I'm still not very comfortable around alligators. But I was warned that the gators aren't the, the biggest thing we were worried about. We were really worried about these giant hives of fire ants that would like float to the surface when it floods. And if those got onto your kayak, like it was bad news. So I was, <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's great. Thanks for telling me that after I was already out in the park and, and, and out here. Um, you know, but we survived. So happy ending. And it was a really magical experience. Again, um, that's me, um, and the, the guide is on the right, Wayne Duchkoff, and in the middle is a woman who is a, an Olympic rower who was actually in town that we, um, for like that weekend because of the World Rowing Championships last year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that's not the only, you know, alligator fire ants are not the only creatures that you'll find out there. Of course, the, the skunk ape is a uh, so-called crypto hominid related to the Bigfoot, and it's been spotted wandering the park, according to, you know, YouTube researchers. Um, this is a, a viral clip from 2013. You know, if you ask park rangers, they'll tell you, you know, oh, it's just somebody in a costume, but I mean, what are they going to tell you really? So, you know. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is the Gator Gal. So this is probably something a lot of people have done. This is um, actually one of the world's largest passenger airboats, which cruises around on the upper lake. Um, a really wonderful, um, you know, way to learn about the water there um, and also about the swampy hammock that surrounds the river in the area. Also, the tram tour is killer. I don't have a side of that, but that's also really fun. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that's a canopy walkway, and this is one of the most popular features. 
Um, I've done it a bunch of times. You know, the view is always incredible. Anytime you're out there, you know, it's so easy to do. It's totally worth going up there. And the views from the top of the tower that are up there are just unbeatable. Um, next slide, please. Um, so why should you care? Um, my guess is that, um, you know, most of the people in this room already do care. But Micro River State Park is facing many of the same threats as those facing uh, the watershed, which Julie's going to talk about, and those facing the river, which Jono is going to touch on, and that are facing many of the other lands and waterways that we're discussing at this summit. Um, but as we talk about those issues and try to figure out solutions, you know, I'm actually well aware of, you know, this, this might sound corny, but I think it's imperative that we kind of deepen our emotional relationships with these lands. You know, it's hard to feel passionate about uh, preserving a piece of land that you've never set foot on. And even if you've been to the park a million times, I know there's a corner of it that you haven't yet explored. Um, so all of you who raised your hand before, you know, go again soon. I'm sure there's something you haven't done out there that you should check out. And for those of you who haven't gone or haven't had a chance to camp out there or kayak along the river or canoe along the river, please go soon and um, tell me all about it. So thanks so much. So my viewpoint, part of the talk, is that changes in the watershed change the river. We heard a lot about that this morning's panel. Um, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the watershed, but I have a deep emotional attachment. <laughs> it's based on hiking and paddling and bird watching and nature exploring in the Mayaka Valley. Next slide, please. This is the um, Mayaka River watershed. To the east is the Peace River watershed. To the north is Manatee River. To the west is the southern coastal watersheds. And Charlotte Harbor is the receiving estuary to the south. Next slide. We're going to take a closer look just quickly at the upper watershed. Um, Mayaka Head, elevation is about 89 feet. Um, that's, you know, that's high for around here, right? <laughs> and. Uh, Drops to 39 feet at Mayaka City. Let's see, I do have a pointer. At Mayaka City, uh, it's down to 14 feet at Upper Mayaka Lake. So 89 to 14. Um, the river moves to the west of the watershed in this image, and to the east are these vast prairies um, that, with sheet flowing sloughs that we'll talk a little bit more about. Next slide, please. And then in the lower watershed, you see how the river's over to the west, and Deer Prairie Slough and Big Big Slough are draining these vast eastern prairies and join the river down here, uh, just south of 41. One north, one, no one south. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to have a few slides that, that talk about then, which is a vague period uh, prior to the 1940s, and then a few slides that talk about um, the watershed now, that show, and I hope to show some changes um, between those two time periods. So this is a 1951 aerial of the upper watershed, the steepest part. And you can see uh, white islands of high dry scrubs. The gray areas are these uh, dry prairies with scattered pines. And then the creeks and streams had uh, hammocks and, and tree vegetation along them, dense trees. Um, next slide. So this is kind of what it felt like to walk around in those, gra in, in those grassy open prairies in the then period. Um, and uh, this kind of landscape was characteristic of most of the watershed. Uh, it depended on frequent low intensity fires and a couple of months, one to two months a year of shallow inundation. Next slide, please. Uh, there were uh, stands of virgin uh, slash pine, and they attracted the interests of turpentine uh, industry and also timber harvests. Next slide, please. In the, the middle of the middle of the watershed uh, was very wet and flat, and so we have Flatford Swamp up here, um, and then Tatum Sawgrass Basin, the marshes associated with Tatum uh, stretching down to Upper Mayaka Lake, and then Lower Lake kind of off the image down here. Next slide. Um, and then down in the lower watershed in Northport, this is a, a map that we created of the landscape cover in 19, based on 1948 aerials. And instead of dry prairie, when you get down to Northport, where the elevation is about 10 feet, um, it's a wet prairie, very wet. And there's these long, linear uh, sloughs and marshes that serve as wet season waterways, and they're all, everything's kind of sheet flowing down towards Charlotte Harbor. Next slide. Um, so getting into the like um, now, uh, 
kind of part of, of the contrast. These are, this is a, a 1948 aerial imagery of um, part of the upper watershed, and you can see here are the isolated ponds, and, and even prior to 1948, they'd started putting in major drainage canals to dry out the landscape. Next slide. So this is just a closer look of that area. Next slide, and a closer look. And the idea was to dry out the landscape. Uh, I think John talked earlier about hoof rot for the cattle. This was a cattle ranching was a major land use, and they wanted to keep the keep the shorten the period of time that everything was inundated. And so there's all these. There's been a lot of this in the watershed. Next slide. Um, so. Uh, this is, you can see, um, here's the bottom of the Tatum Sawgrass Marsh and Upper Mayaka Lake and the river trending this way. Inside the park in conservation management, you have these darker green tones. Outside the park in uh, pasture management, you have um, sort of paler tones that indicate that land use. Next slide, please. Uh, increasingly, we have single family, uh, five acre and greater um, homes in this area, and then uh, increasingly intensive irrigated row ag agriculture production here, row crop agriculture. Next slide. Next slide. So then here's a Google Earth image of um, the lower watershed. So you can see Carlton Reserve here in conservation management, uh, Carlton Ranch here in ranch management. And then uh, what became of the area we saw earlier of Northport with platted subdivisions. Um, uh, so again, the contrast between conservation management, residential development, and um, native range cattle ranching. Next slide. Uh, we made this map kind of uh, comparing the earlier map we made in 1948 showing all those sloughs. So what, what they did when they developed Northport is they took all of those natural marshy sloughs and, and dug deep canals. Um, and they succeeded in drying out the landscape, dropped the surface water table about three feet in order to make it possible to develop the residential properties. Next slide. So. Um, guess I want to remind everybody that in the conservation managed lands, uh, it's still uh, really important that you have um, a month or more of shallow inundation on the supposedly dry prairies, that, but that's natural. And that, uh, next slide, frequent fire is also a really important uh, part of the landscape of the watershed in those conservation areas. Um, and so, next slide. This is what we've accomplished with our deep emotional attachment to the river and its watershed and our, um, our regional commitment to um, conservation of the cultural and native heritage that are encompassed in these conservation lands. And so these are local people have worked with nonprofits and government resources uh, to figure out all different creative ways to conserve all of this in the Mayaka watershed. And, and some of them are working landscapes with conservation easements on them that are uh, managed for cattle. And some of them are places like Mayaka River State Park where the primary focus is uh, conservation. And, and despite all the change, uh, this is the, the best, most diverse, most wildlife full, most beautiful um, watershed in the region. Next slide. So in the late 70s, Julie and I were hired to look at a large swamp in Manatee County. There was a concern that it might be the last place in the state of Florida where the ivory-billed woodpecker may be found. Um, the, it was on the map, but it didn't have a name. We knocked on the door of a house nearby and said, what do you call that swamp? And he said, well, that's the Flat Forward Swamp. So um, that was Flat Forward Swamp. It's two and a half square miles. Uh, we didn't find any ivory-billed woodpeckers. The good news is that the majority of it has been purchased by the Water Management District. The bad news is that most of the trees have been killed by too much water from um, agricultural operations. Next slide. Below Flat Ford Swamp is uh, Mayaka City. And from Mayaka City to the park, it's about 10 miles. This is a journal entry from a trip Julie and I took in 1978, 40 years ago. 
And it says there were um, nine barbed wire fences completely across the river and 30 riverside cottages, shacks, and trailers. Next slide. So this is our, uh, this is not a dock, this is our porch. Um, so as Cooper pointed out, high water's a factor everyone has to deal with uh, if you live along the river. Next slide. And one of the most amazing things about uh, the river and the, and the habitat, the hammocks along there are the epiphytes. So here, here you can see some of the butterfly orchids outside the cabin. Next. Um, the Christmas lichen and resurrection ferns. Next. And the cardinal air plant. These are blooming right now. And the other thing about color in the Mayaka, I had to Gene Blackburn, who's here today. Next slide. The water, because it's stained with tannins, um, has the sort of orange to red spectrum when it's seen against the light colored background. Next slide. And when you have the sky reflecting, you get blues and purples. Next slide. And then when you have vegetation, you get green. So virtually any other, any color of the spectrum you can find waiting in the shallow water of the river at certain times of the year when the water depth is correct, the clarity is correct, and the, then you have a white sandy bottom. So here we are, um, Julie and I, this is a canoe I've had since I was 13. This is Upper Mayaka Lake, and you get an idea of the potential serenity that you can experience in Upper Mayaka Lake. Next slide. Uh, this is a map that shows how we might accommodate 132 power boats on the upper lake. This is, a, this is in the current um, draft management plan for the park. And it's sort of a problem because there's only parking for seven boat trailers. So we're very optimistic that this will be changed in the final draft. Next slide. This is a picture of Chuck Downs and the dam he built with his father. I think some people are critical of Chuck for having done that, but it was done in a different era. And Chuck was a real conservationist. He sold the land on the east side of the river, that part of his ranch, to the um, state park. He put a conservation easement on the property. It's now owned by Mickey Davis. And it was a, a, an honor to get to know Chuck. Next slide. These are some other people I've known, and there's a bunch of others, the Carltons, the Longinos, the Hortons. Um, but what I, the, part of my message is that People that have resources, they may be political resources, they may be land resources, they may be financial resources, but it's people that have resources, that care about the park, that work hand in hand with government to make protection happen. Next slide. This is from a few years ago when their uh, state was proposing to put cattle in a, a globally endangered habitat, dry prairie. And so this is a little Photoshop work I did to try and make the case that we really don't want cows in our dry prairie. Next slide. Julie and I were also hired to survey the Mac River, I think this was also in the 70s, to see if it could be a state wild and scenic river, or state canoe trail, part of, part of the canoe trail system. And at that time, swift mud was not spraying aquatic vegetation, so you had to go through hyacinth jams like this. So we end up in this paradoxical situation with a wild and scenic river that is not part of the state canoe trail system. Next slide. This is about a four foot high sand dune that no one would think of canoeing through. Next slide. This is what it looks like, that white spot. Next slide. Next slide. And yet, when Julie and I first canoed, you had to come around this bend, go along this bluff, a, a saw palmetto bluff, come down here and hook around to leave. Now, that's that sand plug. The new route goes like this. So the point is, the river keeps changing. Heraclitus said you can't step into the same river twice. You cannot canoe the same Mayak River twice. Go ahead. Um, here I am at Sleeping Turtles North. This was property owned by Joe Ligon, who eventually sold his uh, property to the county. And um, you'll see the heights there, uh, September 88, June 92, and June 03. If you think about it, if there was a foot of water over Lido Key, everybody would think we're all going to die. The people that have property along the Mac River have to deal with three or four feet of water annually, and sometimes it's much more than that. Next slide. So I'm going to see if this will work. I just hope that if I had one hope, it would be that Manatee and Charlotte County protect the river. Next slide. They have failed to do so in all these 40, 50 years, and they need to step up and be counted to protect the back of the watershed. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you.